Jesus never went to somebody and said, how much do you believe in me? He said, do you believe in me? Do you believe? There is no measure for that. Praise the Lord, huh? God bless you. The title of my message this morning is Blessed is He. Some of you will know that my favorite person in the Bible is John the Baptist. For a number of reasons. Not only that he is uh, uh, spoken of by Jesus as the greatest prophet uh, beside himself. But John the Baptist touches my heart. Uh, there's a song that I listen to uh, that helps me when I'm driving the car, I'm thinking of things, and I will play this song. I thought I would just uh, read it out to you. It's straight from John 11 where John is thrown into prison. And the reason for it is, is um, oh, it's just horrible. Uh, to, to understand the story better later, you can read John 11. And yet this song encapsulates it so much. There once lived a man called John the Baptist. A mighty prophet of God was he. He came preparing the way for Jesus and gave his life up so completely that one day he's taken to prison and for this gospel he will lose his life. John said, O oh Lord, are you the one or is there someone else to come? And Jesus only gave him this reply, Blessed is he who is not offended in me but lays down his life for my will. And even though it's hard to understand the big picture in my plan, blessed is he who loves me still. In all this life, there are many days of sorrow and some answers just don't ever come. And there are many times that I am tempted to ask why. Don't seem the same for everyone. Then all it takes just one word from heaven and all doubt and frustration moves away oh and that I am strong again trusting in him every time I hear Jesus say blessed is he who is not offended in me but lays down his life for my will and even though it's hard to understand the big picture in my plan blessed is he who loves me still. Blessed are they that say, Lord, I believe. Blessed are they that say, Lord, I believe. We cannot believe, beloved, merely from our mind. We must believe from our heart. As a man believes in his heart and confesses with his mouth. Believes in his heart. There is no measure for believing. Jesus never went to somebody and said, how much do you believe in me? He said, do you believe in me? Do you believe? There is no measure for that. There is a measure for obedience. Oh yeah. There is a measure for courage. But so much ministry around the world has led people to believe that the measurement of my believing will move the hand of God. If that was the case, he would never have come and died for you. For while you were yet a sinner. You either believe or you don't believe. And that's it. Now, it's what you believe in that makes the difference, you see. Confusion comes when we have what is called an over-realized expectation that within itself, a 
ignores the evidence and embraces what is not true. Sidestepping, sidestepping the, dis, the, the, the discipline needed to obtain what we want and who we need to be. Now let me read that out again to you. I want you to get it. I want you to understand it. There are many people that believe in the wrong Jesus. Or there are many people that believe in God and have an over-realized, messed up view of who God is. If you don't believe in the true Jesus, then you will always have issues in your Christian walk. Jesus is God's personal expression of himself to mankind. There is not a 2 out of 10 in believing and a 5 out of 10 in believing. There is either believing or you don't believe. That's it. Now, I'm not talking about courage. I'm not talking about humility. I'm not talking about pride. And I'm not talking about your maturity in the things of God. You want to measure your maturity in God? Go to Galatians chapter 5 and you'll read the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And if you're losing your block every day and you're not managing your mind every day and you're being a bit silly every day... Uh, that has no effect on whether you believe in God or not. I either believe in you or I don't. That's it. There is no measurement on that. And if you want to put a measurement of it, Jesus said, <laughs> you don't need much. In fact, let me read that out. Confusion comes when we have what is called an over, re receive this, an over-realized expectation that within itself ignores the evidence and embraces what is not true. Sidestepping the discipline needed to obtain what we want and who we need to be. How many people believe that God is a magic genie? Do what I want, God. Now, do they believe him more or less than you? Well, he, you either believe him or you don't. It's just that the theology is up the creek. Do you understand that? And see, people have an unrealistic or over-realized imagination as to what this gospel message is. A grain of salt goes into your eye it causes an irritation. Leave it there long enough and it can affect your eyesight. That same, did I say rice or sand? Salt. Salt, that's okay. I just had to, you don't want a grain of rice in there, goodness. You're like a lead brick. No, that it would ruin my example. That same grain of salt or sand in an oyster will cause an irritation and from that we've made a pearl. Irritation is the stuff of life. Does the sand or the salt cause the pearl? No, the irritation does. The irritation brings out the capacity and the ability and the best in the oyster. And sometimes the irritations of life are there to bring out the best in you. You believe in God, you believe in Jesus, no more or less than I do. I don't have more belief. He is either really Jesus or he's not. But if my theology is up the creek, then I'm going to believe he's going to do things that he's not going to do or I'm going to not believe things that I should believe he's going to do. It is when we ignore that we are in this world, Christian. 
but you are not of this world, Christian. You see, it is not about, I, I, I made a choice. I believe in Jesus. From that moment forward, I learn and grow discipline in my life. And the irritations of this world will either cause me to lose my sight or cause me to become a pearl. Can you receive that? And so in this world, he said, guess what? You will have trouble. But rejoice, for I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. You are not of the world. Christian, you are not of the world. Now, the irritation of your Christian walk. Don't tell me that becoming a Christian does not also carry with it elements of irritation. Because you've got to get on with people that ordinarily you probably wouldn't get on with. Church is a hospital, not a palace. Not only that, your Christian walk is the narrow road. So you don't, uh, you know, it, it is just ridiculous for you as a Christian to, to embrace this woke thing that's going on in the world right now. As a Christian, I can tell you that's ungodly. There's a Presbyterian school right now standing up for its rights here in Queensland saying, no, our values are we do not have people in leadership that are gay. Now, my thinking is, parent, you knew that you were sending a child to a Christian school. You knew their values. Don't complain now. And I do believe as Christians, there are irritations that get into the eye or as it is, get into the oyster. And you can, through your belief in God, you, if you have the wrong theology, you will say the wrong thing, believe the wrong thing. For example, you know, you know from the teaching here that most of this spiritual warfare that people go on about is rubbish. Absolute rubbish. It, the Ephesians 6.10 is not about becoming militant and aggressive with the devil. It's becoming obedient and faithful to God. Do you understand that? That's what it is. All of this, I rebuke you devil. Nowhere in the New Testament or in the whole Bible does it say you should walk around rebuking the devil. Now, if somebody manifests in front of me, well, I can get authority over that. But people spend their life with this. You see, see, but that person that's running around in spiritual warfare, they believe in God the same as I do. There is no difference. It's just that their theology is up the creek. <laughs> and, or, or you've got a Christian living in sin and it's not about whether they believe in God it's that they're disobedient to God you go to what we call a backslidden Christian and I've never liked that term but nonetheless you go to a backslidden Christian and I'd say to you well the ones that I've spoken to almost 100% of them will say, yes, I love God. Yes, I love Jesus. Yes, I believe. I haven't changed that at all. What's changed? What's changed? They've changed in their behavior and they have been caught up in sin. And so, friend, you are in the world, but you are not of the world. The reason I say this on believing is that there has been a very backward teaching on believing throughout the last 30 or 40 years that if you do not believe enough, God won't move for you. Well, knowing all of you, I would say you believe, that's it. There is no scale of believing. You either believe or you don't believe. Does that make sense? Yes or no, right? It does make sense. There is no measurement on that. If you want to measure anything, you can measure God's faithfulness and yet, that is limitless. And that is eternal. God loves you, friend. God loves you with an everlasting love. In 1 Corinthians, we read, Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared 
for those who love him. The gospel always was a gospel of love and of heart. The Bible does not say that you believe with your mind. It says you believe in your heart. You see, if you came to the Lord with your mind, you're a candidate for walking away. Because you did not come to the Lord with your heart. You perhaps came under a false doctrine to God. And you said, I believe in you. And I believe you are Lord. Or you were in a meeting where there was a lot of emotion going on. And then it was an event to you. And then you walked out and you were more interested in the brand new car or the pretty girl walking down the street or something else that was going on. And all it was was a head thing. It was never a heart thing. But I can assure you of this, if you have received Christ in your heart and confessed him with your mouth, friend, you are saved. And you, I do not believe any more than what you believe. Now, there may be somebody here more obedient than you, more humble than you, living more righteously than you, giving more than you, but please don't think they believe God more than you. They believe the same. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth, will speak. And God has a lot for you. Blessed is he who is not offended in me, but laid down his life for my will. And even though it's hard to understand the big picture in my plan, blessed is he who loves me still. Extraordinary what I said about the sand, the salt in the eye, and also in the um, oyster. You see, over the decades, there's been much teaching go on that you should be living in wealth. And God is a God of abundance. God is a God of your supply. All of that is true in the sense of him being your supply. But if you were poor or not doing well, then perhaps you were doing something wrong where you didn't believe enough. And right there and then, you can imagine that Christian thinking, well, I've got to believe God more. No. No. No, not at all. Perhaps you're just bad with money. Perhaps you just need to get a job. Huh? Perhaps what you need to do is stop playing the lotto or the scratchy tickets. Or perhaps what you need to do is get with people that can help you financially. Now, I'm not putting any condemnation on anyone. But I am saying it's got nothing to do with whether you believe in God enough or have enough faith. You were given enough faith to receive Christ. You've got plenty to see you through. From, ha from that moment forward, you rejoice in the things of God. Get your theology right, get your doctrine right, and you'll be good to go. You see, what I love about John the Baptist is that after he received that reply, Blessed is he who is not offended in me. After he received the reply, he went silent and just accepted it. And do you know why? Because he believed. Now he needed a bit of courage. And he, needed, he probably needed a hug. But he didn't need to believe anymore. He already believed. I love that he received the reply and then you hear nothing more of John. He just goes silent and falls into the will of God for his life. Oh, praise the Lord. You see, in John 16, verse 33, these things... These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. What's he saying? These things I have spoken to you, that in me you will have what? Peace. And then he connects this whole sentence, in this world you will have trouble. Peace, trouble, peace. Tr now hang on. My peace and my joy and the source of my supply is God. And in this world I will have trouble. 
If you have an over-realized understanding or expectation or a poor theology of God, you won't accept that verse. That's a verse you'll skip over. Now, I'm not preaching trouble. I'm preaching peace in the middle of it. That you might believe in God. He said, be of good cheer. Now, how many people have read that and said, be of good cheer? You've just gone and told me that in this world I will have trouble. I thought becoming a Christian I'd be taken out of trouble. No, you are in the world. Do you believe? Come on, congregation. Now, there are people that can, will be able to hear you this morning on the video. I want to ask my congregation, do you believe? Yeah. Yes. I believe. Would you say that with me? I believe. Now that's it. There is no measure on that. Here's what I know. My good old mama, God bless her, she used to say, actions speak louder than words. Now if you believe, I'll know. And so will everyone else. It'll be obvious. It'll be obvious. You will change in your heart. You will change in your life. Don't tell me you believe in God. And then shack up with the world. I'll be able to say to you, no, you don't. Oh, you believe the history books about Jesus, perhaps. You want to commemorate the cross and the resurrection. But Maya, I'm asking you, beyond commemorating the fact that he is God, have you participated in the cross and the resurrection and received eternal life? My question is, do you believe? Now, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, that's, that's it. That's a done deal now. From there, you grow in obedience. From there, you go through the salt in the eye and the salt in the oyster and one's going to irritate and the other's going to grow a pearl in your life. I love John the Baptist because when he receives the word, he goes quiet. These things I have said, I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In me, your peace is in God. Your peace is in God. Not in whether I'm a great preacher or you've got a great husband or a great wife or great children. Like this, this dad here has got a great boy there. You're blessed. And I'm sure you know you are. But I'll tell you what, I bet, I'm sure you are blessed you've got a great dad. But that's not always the case, is it? How many children listening to this, young people are listening to this thinking, well, you've identified somebody there that's got a great dad. I wish I had a great dad. Your peace, young man or young woman, is in God. Not from your father. Not Stop blaming. There are apparently 400 personality alterations in a person from birth to approximately 20 years old. 400 that were in you at conception and there ain't nothing your parents can do to influence that. Nothing. There, nothing they can do to influence it. You are going to go through these 400 personality alterations, maturity steps in your life. You would exhibit the good and the bad. It's all going to come out. And by the age of 20, let me tell you, we know what you're going to be the rest of your life if you don't receive Christ. Don't blame your parents. It was in you. Back in the day, they used to say, he's a good seed or she's, well, he's a bad seed. People knew. Right? They didn't know the science of it, but they knew. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. And that's the beginning. That says it all. I start my day off. I'm in the middle of a challenge. I can remember the first roller coaster on. Going up was good. Coming down, I'm screaming out, Lord, I believe. <laughs> Help. Even biology glorifies God. Even biology. In biology, there is something called a cell adhesion molecule. Very then. Now, I'm not a biologist. So for me, I have to read up about these things. 
and talk to people and get an understanding. But oh my goodness, am I excited about this? I'm excited about this because I didn't realize how extraordinary this self-adhesion molecule is. It's actually called laminin. Who's heard of it? Yeah, one person, maybe two. Laminin, if you talk to a biologist, well, you, you talk about laminin, they'll, they'll be so excited. At, at, because what they'll, that, this is what they'll tell you. Laminin holds the skin on your body. Without laminin, you don't have the skin on your body anymore. And it keeps your organs in place. It keeps everything together. Now, a biologist listening to this will say, yeah, he's definitely not a biologist. But here's the thing. Laminin is a self-adhesion molecule that holds everything that you are together. Without laminin, you cease to be. God is glorified within our DNA and within laminin. You're going, really? How would you like to see laminin? You are looking at a self-adhesion molecule. And the extraordinary thing is, it's in the form of what? The cross. the cross. How would you like to see an actual electronic microscopic image of laminin? And there it is. Even within, brethren, I, <clears throat> you're just looking at me like, wow, that is amazing. Do you see how amazing that is? <clears throat> It's a self-adhesion molecule that without it, you would cease, you would cease to be. Everything you have would fall apart. You say, well, I'm experiencing that. <laughs> but the truth is, beloved, even within your DNA is the message of the cross. Say with me, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Come on. Man, I tell you what. There's nothing else. There's no one else. It don't, <clears throat> start off with, Lord, I believe. Read your word. And know who Jesus really is. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. <clears throat> he is the what? The image of the invisible God. I've never seen laminin before. But I believe. He is the image of the... What, 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 let's get it right. He is the image of the invisible God. But I believe. I believe. I believe. Over all creation, for by him... What does it say? Think of this laminin. you got the picture right there. Have a look at this. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Visible and what? Invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers or things present, uh, all things were created through him and for him and he is before all things and in him all things consist. The NIV puts it, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. God is holding you together. In fact, you're going to look back one day and go, Oh, wow, I didn't realize how you did hold it all together any more than I knew about laminin. But God's message is written in within your very DNA, Lord, I believe even though it's hard to understand the big picture in your hand. Lord, I believe. Believe in God. Believe in God. Because it's not about, you see, as I was sharing with one woman early this week, 
who said to me, I've stopped believing in God. I, I, I don't believe in God anymore. I said, well, you've said it three times, but that tells me is you do believe in God. She says, no, I don't. I said, that's the fourth. Yes, you do. Here's your problem. You've stopped believing that God believes in you. There's your problem. And she just broke down and cried. I said, see, you never stop believing in God. You just don't believe you're of any value for God to listen to you or to hear you. God loved you enough to die for you. Now my question is, do you love him enough to live for him? And as we shared, she just bored her eyes out and she said those words, okay, 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 I believe. You see, friend, it never was a question as to whether or not you believe or not. If you said you believe, if you believe in your heart, that's it. Now it's a case of doing the journey as John did the journey. Are you the one? What happens in this world where it doesn't go the way you wanted, like John, it just didn't go the way John wanted. And the irritation is there. And this irritation has gone into the oyster. And the irritation just, oh, go away. And you're not getting the answer. And Christians sometimes, look, as a preacher, I don't want to say this, but I've got to be honest. What's the, what's the word for the year? What is it? Truth. The truth is sometimes you don't get the answer. You don't get the answer. John didn't, John didn't get the answer he wanted. Sometimes you do get the answer. Sometimes the husband's a dirty, low-down scumbag, and sometimes so is the wife. Sometimes your children walk away. Sometimes you can't pay your bills. Sometimes you go bankrupt. Sometimes the police pull you over, and they start off by saying, good evening, and you go, not really. And sometimes it works well, and sometimes it's great. And if I gave you a million dollars right now, I'm sure I'd be your favorite person for the rest of the year. And I'm sure you'd be happy. But if I placed a condition on that million dollars that you could not breathe tomorrow or the next day, I'm sure you'd say you can keep your million dollars, which means you just placed a million dollar value on breathing. The source of my life has to see, it's not about whether you believe, it's whether about who you believe in and you have a realistic understanding that you are in this world, not of this world. Things will not always go your way and that irritation can either cause you to lose your sight or cause you to become a pearl. Can you receive that? God is in the center of it all. He's even in the center of your DNA. Blessed is he who is not offended in me. Oh Lord, I'm not going to be offended. I'm not going to be offended believing you even if they walk away. I'm going to stand up for you. I praise God for that Presbyterian church that said no. No, this is what we believe. You sent your children here. You enrolled them knowing fully what we believe. We're not going to change that now. I'm so glad. They're not here for a fist to cuff. They don't want to have a fight over it. They're just saying that's what we believe. The world wants to have it. Did you know the Christian church is not racist? The world is. Absolutely. We are not racist. You don't need to preach racism or anti-racism to the Christian church. We love people. That's what our Messiah told us to do. That's what our boss said to do. We're under the authority of God. And he said, love your neighbor. So we love black, white, yellow yeah, yeah, we even love white people. We do. What does he say here? Did I not say to you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So the question I have for you this morning is, do you believe? If you do, then this be upon you. Blessed is he who is not offended in me, but lays down his life for my will. Dear Heavenly Father, we receive your word. We thank you even within the DNA. Even within our DNA, this laminin, you are there. The cross is right there reminding us 
All things are from you, through you, and to you. And so we come to you humbly on our knees. And we say, Jesus, Jesus, I believe. In Jesus' precious name. Can you receive that, church? God bless you.